pleasure to be back in this beautiful city, which I've been here all often, and to be able to share with you the findings of a uh, rather ambitious effort, the most ambitious thing we've ever attempted in RMI, we're not noted for lacking ambition, uh, is the work of 61 of us over a year and a half with much help from industry on both content and, and peer review. And let me if I can borrow the book back again, I'll just wait for that. This is, uh, thank you, this is a result, it's a, a very graphics and case and data rich but readable business book called Reinventing the Fire. Uh, if, by the way, you're planning to read it electronically, I do not recommend the Kindle version. You need both color and layout to understand the book, but the Google Books version is a PDF that has a and there's the Wished Up Trees version. I apologize, it's in American uh, barbaric units, as you know, we're moving towards the metric system inch by inch. <laughs> <laughs> there are also conditions in quite a few other languages. It is introduced by the uh, president of Shell Oil Company and the chair of Exelon, which uh, Tom which is the biggest nuclear, third biggest coal fired electric company in the country. Uh, and uh, I think it has wide application to other countries. I work in 50 of them. And actually, in a fortnight, we will announce in Beijing a major collaboration with the leading energy arms of the Chinese government to bring this thinking into the 13 five year plan, and they're, they're quite excited about that. We started this work by asking some big, bold questions. Uh, what if we could make energy do our work without working our undoing? A matter of some interest here where you depend on the Gulf Stream and it may just lose interest, in which case you'll be living in Labrador. Uh, could we imagine fuel without fear? Could we reinvent fire? And we chose that big poetic title because millions of years ago, fire made us human, and fossil fuels made us modern. And now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, healthy, and durable. That turns out to be not just practical, but cheaper than what we argue, so let's see how. Now, four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning each year 19 cubic kilometers of the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo and dinosaur dung. As a member of the National Petroleum Council, I should tell you, and it's true, uh, that those fossil fuels have built our civilization and created our wealth and enriched the lives of billions of people. But they also have rising costs to our security, economy, health, and environment, and <coughs> eroding, if not outweighing their benefits, so we need a new fire. And switching from the old to the new fire means changing two big stories, oil and electricity, each of which puts two-fifths of the fossil carbon into the air. Uh, these are quite distinct stories. In most industrialized countries, almost no electricity is still made from oil in the U.S. It's less than 1%. But their uses are similarly concentrated. Uh, three-fourths of, of U.S. oil fuels mobility, three-fourths of U.S. electricity powers buildings, the rest of both powers factories, so very efficient transport and buildings and factories. Um, we'll save a lot of oil and coal and natural gas that can displace both. But today's U.S. energy system is, is not only inefficient, it's also disconnected, aging, dirty, and insecure. It needs refurbishment. But by 2050, it will become efficient, connected, and distributed with elegantly frugal autos, buildings, and factories uh, all relying on a secure, modern, and resilient electricity system. So we can eliminate our addiction to oil and coal by 2050 and use a third less natural gas uh, while switching to threefold more efficient use <coughs> and three-fourths renewable supply. That's the transition I'll be describing for the U.S. And of course, all the way through, please be thinking about the Irish analogs and differences. I, I think we'll find the similarities are more important than the differences. <coughs> By 2050, we found that this transition could cost the United States $5 trillion less in net present value 
than business as usual, uh, <coughs> counting carbon and all other external or hidden costs at zero value, a conservatively low estimate. Uh, and yet this cheaper energy system could support a 158% bigger economy, all without oil or coal, or for that matter, nuclear energy. And we also found this transition would need no new inventions and no new national taxes, mandates, subsidies, or laws, thus going around Washington gridlock. That's perhaps the most surprising part, so I'll say it again. I'm going to tell you how to get the United States, for example, completely off oil and coal by 2050, $5 trillion cheaper, with no act of Congress led by business for profit. So the idea is to use our most effective institutions, which in a U.S. context means private enterprise co-evolving with civil society, uh, spent by military innovation, to go around our least effective institutions, such as the Congress. And this is a very intense ideological approach, because whether you care most about profits and jobs and competitive advantage, uh, or about traditional and rural uh, values and, and uh, local autonomy, uh, or about national security, or about uh, creation, care, and environmental stewardship, and uh, climate protection and public health, regardless of, of your values, reinventing fire makes sense and makes money. Now, General Eisenhower reputedly said that expanding the boundaries of a tough problem makes it soluble by encompassing more options and synergies and degrees of freedom. In other words, by including the stuff the solution requires. Uh, that's different from our usual reflex of chopping a tough problem into smaller pieces to make it bite-sized. So to enlarge the boundaries of the energy problem, we integrated all four energy-using sectors, transport, buildings, industry, which statistically includes agriculture, uh, and electricity production. And we integrated four kinds of innovation, not just the usual two of technology and public policy, but also two very powerful ones normally left out, namely design, the way we combine technologies, and strategy, new business models, new competitive strategies. Those combinations turn out to be much more powerful than the sum of the parts, and they create some deeply disruptive business opportunities. Where should we start? Well, the US, for example, pays $2 billion a day for oil, plus another $4 billion a day for the economic and military costs of our oil addiction. So since the biggest user of oil is autos, let's start by making autos oil free. Two thirds of the energy needed to move a typical car is caused by its weight. And every unit of energy you save with the wheels by taking out weight or drag or rolling resistance saves another six units of energy you needn't waste getting it to the wheels. So it saves in all seven units of energy at the tank. Huge leverage from light weighting. And yet for the past quarter century, uh, our two-ton autos have suffered an epidemic of obesity that gave way twice as fast as we did. Um, but fortunately today, we have ultralight, ultra-strong materials like carbon fiber composites that can make dramatic weight savings snowball and can make autos simpler and cheaper to build. Lighter and more slowly <coughs> autos need less force to move them, so their engine gets smaller. In fact, it gets small enough you can afford to electrify the propulsion because you need two or three times fewer of those costly batteries or fuel cells. So they get smaller, lighter, cheaper, and the total purchase price of the vehicle falls to about today's level, whilst the driving cost per kilometer is much lower from the beginning. And these innovations in that sequence can transform automakers from bringing tiny savings out of essentially Victorian uh, steel stamping and, and engine technologies to the steeply falling costs of three closely linked technologies, namely ultralight materials, their structural manufacturing, and electric propulsion. And if you're exploiting as an automaker three steep and synergistic learning curves whilst your, your competitor is out on the flat part of just one, you win. Uh, the sales of such vehicles can grow and the prices can drop even faster with a temporary fee bait, that is, rebates for efficient new vehicles paid for by fees on inefficient ones. 
There are five such programs in Europe, plus one in Singapore. The biggest in Europe, the French one, although it's not revenue neutral, alas, uh, tripled in its first two years the speed of improving auto efficiency, and that's even before uh, the effect of essentially applying a societal discount rate to automakers' decisions about what to build could work through and change the product slate. That's about 90% of the effect that is still to come. Uh, of course, for a country without an auto industry, just buying them, uh, you're sort of at the mercy of what the market provides, but you will certainly have buyers making very different choices if they can uh, take a long view and look at all 15 years' worth of fuel savings when they make a, a vehicle purchase decision rather than just looking at the first <coughs> one or two or three years uh, as they do now. So it's as unimportant a decision as whether to buy floor mats. Uh, by the way, the auto dealers will make a lot more money on the efficient uh, units as well. Now, the, the resulting shift to electric autos will be as game-changing as shifting from small refinements in typewriters to the dramatic Moore's law-driven gains in computers. Uh, information technology is now America's biggest industry, uh, typewriter makers have vanished. So, vehicle fitness opens a powerful new automotive competitive strategy that has caused somewhere between four and seven automakers to adopt it or be in course of adopting it right now, <coughs> along with the U.S. Department of Energy, which uh, was finally persuaded last year uh, that rather than trying first to make batteries cheaper, it makes more sense to make batteries fewer by designing the car properly. Then you sell a lot of cars, then the batteries get cheaper, so you get to the same goal with less time, cost, and risk. Now, a lot of different countries uh, could be leading this automotive revolution. The barriers are form formidable, but they're much more cultural than they're technical or economic. Detroit's new leaders have had their minds wonderfully concentrate concentrated by two bankruptcies are uh, starting to take this very seriously for helping. But actually, the current leader is Germany. Uh, and uh, starting this year, Volkswagen will be in low volume production of this carbon fiber uh, 0.9 liter per 100 kilometer two seat plug-in hybrid. And BMW will be in mid volume production of two models, and this one and a more sporty variant, uh, starting with about 30,000 a year, of a carbon fiber electric car. They confirm that the carbon fiber is paid for by needing fewer batteries. And their CEO says in speeches, we do not intend to be a typewriter maker because he can look across Munich to where, until I think 92, Olympia used to make excellent typewriters. There are some, uh, and by the way, Audi recently showed a, a carbon fiber plug-in hybrid concept SUV rated at 100, 0.9 liters per 100 kilometers. It's very similar to the design 13 years ago. Um, seven years ago, an even faster and cheaper American manufacturing technology from the spin-off I used to chair uh, made this carbon cap uh, in one minute. And you can tell from the sound how immensely strong and stiff it is. That's two-thirds carbon fiber and one-third thermoplastic, so it's plastic, but uh, rings like a metal bell. It's actually tougher than titanium, so let's pass it around. Just don't worry about dropping it. Uh, Tom, Tom Freeman uh, hit it as hard as he could with the sledgehammer, couldn't even make a mark. So with such manufacturing techniques that can now scale to automotive cost and speed, but with essentially aerospace machines, uh, you could save four-fifths of the capital needed for automaking. You could actually afford to set up an auto plant in, in Ireland, uh, wherever you want. Uh, customized to local conditions. Uh, you could uh, save a lot of lives because such materials absorb six to 12 times the crash energy of steel per kilo and do so more smoothly. And in the US alone, the oil saving <coughs> would be like finding one and a half Saudis or half an OPEC uh, by drilling in a very prospective play called the Detroit Formation. And those neg barrels under Detroit, safe barrels, turn out to cost $18 each. And they are uh, inexhaustible, domestic, carbon-free, and secure. Uh, 
Uh, now, those German cars use a process that's much faster and more economical than the <coughs> fiber race cars. But it's more, it, it's, it's actually um, sort of derived from the way we make aerospace advanced composites. And in aerospace, you have a thousand times lower volume and higher cost than you would need for series production of cars. But I started to get encouraged this enormous gap might be bridged when I met a young engineer at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, Dave Taggart, a uh, Scottish lad, and he, he had uh, figured out how to make a joint strike fighter airframe 95% out of advanced composite, but one third lighter and two thirds cheaper than the 72% metal normal design, because it was designed on a clean sheet to be optimally makeable from carbon, not from metal. Well, this was a bit too much uh, radical design, so uh, he activated the immune system of the Joint Strike Fighter community. So he left Skunk Works, and one day later I was able to hire him uh, to do the same thing for cars. So he led the design with a British and a uh, German Tier 1 uh, of this uncompromised mid-size SUV, five adults in comfort. Hulls a half ton up a 44% grade, two cubic meters of cargo, zero to 100k in seven or eight seconds. Uh, controls and steers with a right or left joystick and right or left seat, plug it in whatever you want. Here it is up display. Um, a very similar user interface concept to today's Tesla S. It's all functionality in software. So it's kind of a computer with wheels on a car with chips. Sony PlayStation's had way cool. But uh, what's perhaps more interesting about it, besides the, the remarkable attributes uh, and the uh, roughly four to six times greater efficiency, uh, is the way it's built. If you look inside, there are only 14 parts in the body, each of which can be made with one low pressure die set. In a steel SUV body, you'd have 10 or 20 times more parts, each, each with an average of four progressive steel stamping die sets. So you save off the bat about 98 or 99% of the tooling cost. Each of the parts can then be lifted with one hand and no hoist. The biggest part on the side, I can briefly lift with one finger. And the parts have clevis joints that snap precisely together, self-fixturing for bonding. So you don't need the robotic body shop. And if you lay color in the mold, you don't need the paint shop either. They're one of the two hardest and costliest steps in making the car. Altogether, you save 80% of the capital in automaking. Uh, and the propulsion system gets two-thirds smaller and it's lighter and cheaper. All these savings together pay for the carbon fiber. That's how the ultralighting is approximately free. So the $18 a barrel is not to pay for the carbon fiber. That's already covered. It's to pay for the electrification. And the carbon fiber itself is about to get much cheaper. And uh, of course, you also make weight saving <coughs> snowball through this series, and you keep going around this loop until the things that made it cost more actually turn into things that make it cost less. Uh, and a lot of parts don't simply get smaller when you're supporting less weight, so you need less suspension to hold it up, less engine to move it, less brakes to stop it. Um, a lot of parts go away. In a good series, you would, uh, hybrid, you would not need transmission, clutch, flywheel, axles, differentials, drive shaft, U joint, starter, alternator. When that kit goes away, uh, you get jumps in weight saving, which then compound around the spiral some more, saving still more weight because the less weight you have, the less weight you need. How, how far can you go? Well, using the same design process we borrowed from the Skunk Works uh, and offered to Toyota. They designed six years ago this concept car that has the same interior volume as a classic Prius hybrid, uh, but half the fuel use and one third of the weight. Uh, 420 kilos for a plug-in hybrid, 400 kilos for a regular hybrid. And uh, just in case anyone thought they were doing this for amusement, the previous day, uh, Torre, the world's biggest maker of carbon fiber, announced a big factory to mass-produce carbon fiber car parts for Toyota, not a phrase previously much heard in the industry. Four other automakers later joined that consortium. So BMW and Volkswagen will still have, will soon have worthy competitors and not only in Japan. 
Um, and of course, any kind of advanced powertrain is enabled by this sort of ultralight platform. Um, oh, sorry about the news. But uh, when you make the car so efficient that it, it will cruise on the highway on the same power to the wheels that a normal SUV uses on a hot afternoon to run the air conditioner, uh, the, you know, you're using three times less power to move the, the car, so the hydrogen tanks for a normal range, 530 kilometers, get three times smaller, so you don't need any breakthrough in storage. These are off-the-shelf tanks that have been around since the 90s, extremely safe. And the fuel cell gets three times smaller, uh, so on normal assumptions that every doubling of cumulative production volume cuts the real cost 20%, you would need about 30 times less cumulative production to get down to a competitive price on the fuel cell. Uh, and indeed, the, the industry is already down to a lower price than, than our analysis assumed. So this cuts a decade or two off the deployment time. I mention this because uh, if you end up making more wind power than you actually require onshore or offshore, uh, you may make a lot more money uh, selling each electron with a proton attached uh, and selling hydrogen. Uh, and uh, that, that could be a very interesting way to diversify your energy supplies and uh, absorb some of the variability of the wind power. Now, the same physics and the same business logic apply with variations to heavy vehicles as well. Uh, for example, two-thirds of the energy it takes to move a heavy lorry over the road is air drag. Well, it doesn't look all that different from this Quebec bus, which has halved air resistance through more subtle design details. And altogether, <clears throat> you can triple the efficiency of heavy lorries. Uh, this is starting to <coughs> move nicely towards the market, and already just design and logistical improvements are enabling Walmart to haul each case of merchandise in its heavy lorry fleet, the biggest civilian fleet in the world, with uh, 44% less fuel than they used in 2005. We also have triple to quintuple efficiency airplanes on the design screens of places like Boeing, NASA, and MIT. So when you add up all the heavy vehicles, there's almost a trillion dollars of, of net fuel saving to be had in the U.S. And of course, those are all global products that you would be able to buy as well. And uh, similarly for, for light and medium markets. Uh, the revolution in efficiency in both light and heavy vehicles is accelerated by the military efficiency revolution I've been driving for about 30 years. And uh, it's flowered beautifully in the past five years. Uh, it's, so what we're going to see is very like when military R&D gave us the internet, the global positioning system, uh, the jet engine industry, the microchip industry, many of the foundations of the modern economy, except this time it will be driving oil savings in the civilian economy, which uses 50-odd times more oil than the military. I like that leverage. And the result will be that we won't need the oil, we won't need to fight over the oil, and our warfighters can have mega missions in the Persian Gulf of the South China Sea, uh, mission unnecessary. They really like that idea. There are also, of course, ways to get better access with less driving. In the U.S. case, 46 to 84 percent less driving by combining four methods well proven in Europe, ranging from sensible spatial planning to uh, car and ride sharing uh, enabled by Spark IT, and uh, we've also proven a nice method for charging drivers for road infrastructure by the kilometer, not by the liter. Uh, so when you combine all that, you can save $1.4 trillion dollars by driving less to get where you want to be, and preferably be already where you want to be, so you need to go somewhere else. Uh, so by these means, you can get a much more mobile U.S. economy in 2050 using no oil, and saving or displacing each barrel across all the classes of mobility turns out to cost about $25 rather than buying it for well over $100. So that difference saves you $4 trillion net present value. 
If I had counted, which I didn't, just the hidden economic and military costs <coughs> of oil dependence, which certainly have an allies in Ireland, uh, then that would be $12 trillion, not four. So to get off oil, uh, with all this extra mobility, to phase out the oil, we need first to get efficient. Some of the savings are baked into the government forecast. Most were not in them. And here's a bit for a more productive use of vehicles. And then the what are two liter equivalent per 100 kilometer cars can run on any combination of electricity in yellow, hydrogen in green, and advanced biofuels in orange. The heavy lorries and aircraft can realistically run on hydrogen or advanced biofuels, or the lorries could run on natural gas, but no vehicles will need oil. Uh, and the amount of biofuel required is small enough that you can make two-thirds of it from waste and you wouldn't need any cropland, you wouldn't be harming the soil or climate. In fact, you could pay farmers for taking the carbon out of the air and putting it back in tilt where it belongs. Now, our little team speeds these kinds of oil savings by what we call institutional acupuncture. If the business logic is congested and not flowed properly, we insert the needles at appropriate points of partners like Walmart, Ford, and Pentagon. And this log transition is already <clears throat> well underway. Uh, in fact, even four years ago, mainstream analysts were starting to see peak oil not in supply, but first in demand. Because as with whale oil uh, in the 1850s, uh, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. This is not new in economic history. <clears throat> it's just what Sheikh Mohammed said too long ago when he said that the Stone Age didn't end because the world ran out of stones and the Oil Age won't end because the world runs out of oil. Uh, well, on this 40th anniversary of the first oil shock, I think we can say that that prophecy is being very nicely fulfilled. Um, but the electrified autos that help bring it about do not need to add new burdens uh, to the electricity system. Rather, when smart autos exchange electricity and information through smart buildings with smart grids, they are adding to the grid distributed storage and flexibility that help the grid to accept varying solar and wind power. And electrified autos therefore make the auto and electricity problems, especially on a small island, easier to solve together than separately. And they also converge the oil story with our second big story, namely, saving electricity and then making it differently. And those twin revolutions in electricity promise more numerous and diverse and profound disruptions in electricity than in any other sector. Because we've got basically 21st century technology and speed in much of the world colliding head on with 20th and even 19th century institutions, rules, and cultures. That's why you're really blessed that, that ESB is, is getting very forward looking on these issues. And uh, I think that sort of leadership is exactly what's needed and a great example of other countries. Now, changing how we make electricity does get a lot easier if we need less of it. Today, most of it is wasted. Uh, <coughs> uh, and the efficiency techniques keep improving faster than we install them. So the unbought reservoir in megawatts keeps getting bigger and cheaper. But as buildings and industries start to catch up and to get efficient faster than they grow, uh, for example, US electricity demand could, is officially forecast to grow 1% a year, much less than the historic levels. Uh, but it could instead shrink at 1% a year, even after the extra use for the efficient cars. Uh, and in fact, we seem to be already on or beyond this trajectory, uh, partly because of modern building standards that came into force in half the states in the past couple of years. So just last year, not yet weather adjusted, but this won't make much difference, the electricity used to make a dollar of real GDP in the United States fell in one year by 3.7%. We've never seen anything like that before. And the notion of stagnant or falling electricity demand even as, indeed, as a driver of the economy growing 2.4% a year real, 
uh, is now starting to be viewed as the new normal by our electricity industry. And we can keep demand dropping by reasonably accelerating existing trends, specifically in buildings which use or mind you three-fourths of U.S. electricity. <coughs> the energy productivity can be tripled or quadrupled with a 33% internal rate of return. Uh, that is, we can save $1.4 trillion in at present value and the savings are worth four times their cost. I'm not counting here non-energy benefits of energy savings. For example, 6 to 16% higher labor productivity, inefficient offices, 20 odd percent faster learning in well daily schools, uh, 6 to 40 percent higher retail sales in well daily shops, better production quality in efficient factories, fresher food in efficient fridges, and so on. Uh, those kinds of indirect non energy benefits are now very well documented. You'll find a 650 page tome on them and what they add to real estate value at uh, greenbuildingfc.com. Uh, we're not counting any of that, even though those non-energy benefits are often worth 10 or more times as much as the energy savings we did count. So this can be a huge boost to the economy. Similarly, in industry, we could roughly double energy productivity at a 21% internal rate of return. And to achieve these things by 2050 in the U.S., we would just need to ramp up over 20 years the average adoption of efficiency to levels that some of our states have already achieved, whatever this is possible. I think the average efficiency potential in Europe is not greatly different. It's a lot of the details differ, but uh, American buildings have gotten a bit better than you might expect. And uh, we just had a very interesting conversation about how to accelerate similar efforts already underway in Ireland. Now, there is a disruptive innovation I want to emphasize here called integrative design that can do even better than normally supposed because it can often make very large energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into expanding returns. And that theme runs throughout our work. You'll find many practical cases about it. But that's, that's how, for example, our content retrofit is saving two-fifths of the energy in the Empire State Building. Uh, we first uh, set up a little temporary window factory on the vacant fifth floor, and uh, some of the Teamsters uh, uh, remanufactured all 6,514 double glazed windows uh, on site into super windows that insulate three or four times better and are essentially perfect in letting in light but blocking heat. And that plus other improvements uh, then uh, cut the maximum cooling load by a third, and that meant we could renovate smaller chillers instead of handing bigger chillers. So that saved $17 million of capex, which paid back most of the cost right away of the rest of the improvements, and cut the payback on the, on the net investment to just three years. There was a major energy service company that also offered a three-year payback, but they didn't get the job because their savings were six times smaller. That's because they use normal disintegrated design where you optimize each component singly for single benefits, whereas we optimize the whole building as a system for multiple benefits. And by doing that, lately in some other retrofits of big buildings, we're seeing savings as much as 70%. Some old buildings can now be made better than the best new building. That, that was a big surprise. So the state of the art is moving very rapidly, and by the way, for an all glass and no windows, curtain wall sort of office building, the savings on the cooling load can be two thirds, the total energy savings can be three fourths, at a lower cost than the regular 20 year renovation that saves nothing, provided that you time the whole building deep retrofit at the time when you were going to renew the facade anyway, which you have to do every 20 years because the glazing seals fail. So if you go to retrofitdepot.org, you'll find tools for portfolio owners to do exactly that. Now, here's another interesting example, especially if you end up living in Labrador, um, <laughs> because the Gulf Stream loses interest and wanders off. That's a distinct possibility. We've known that since the 60s. Uh, I happen to live at 2,200 meters up in the Rocky Mountains, uh, 
near Aspen. And this building, which is a house, jungle, and research center where we hatched our institute, is in a rather severe climate. It used to go down to minus 44 Celsius on occasion. You can get 39 days of continuous cloud in midwinter. You can get frost any day of the year. We just had snow a few weeks ago. Um, but this was a prototype, a forerunner of the passive house movement that's built over 30,000 houses in Europe that, like ours, have no heating system. They don't need one. They're so well insulated, but they have roughly normal construction costs. And it doesn't need to look like this to work like this. Uh, now, if you come into this super window glazed atrium, the glass looks like two sheets of glass, costs less than three, but insulates like 14. Uh, this is what it looks like during a February snowstorm. Uh, and you can see two of the five banana crops that were ripening at the time. In fact, we've just harvested banana crops number 46 and 47, twins on the same stalk. Uh, I didn't know you could do that, uh, but the tree figured it out. And actually, it harvested itself because the bananas weighed 30 kilos and they simply pulled down the tree uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, now, when I first moved in, uh, this house was using 1% of the normal space and water heating energy and a tenth of normal electricity and half the normal water, all with a 10-month payback. Today's technologies are a lot better, so we've now retrofitted them. We're measuring 300 data streams to see how much better they are. The trouble is the measuring equipment seems to use more electricity than the lights and appliances. Uh, but this sort of approach of integrated design applies to any climate. It's been used to eliminate air conditioning up to 46 Celsius, which is not a limit, with lower construction <coughs> costs and better comfort. It's been used in steamy Bangkok <coughs> to uh, save about 90% of air conditioning energy with normal construction costs and better comfort. And uh, wherever you are, the idea is to get multiple benefits from single expenditures. So this white arch holding up the middle of the building has 12 functions, but it has only one cost. The same approach can multiply the half trillion dollars of conventional energy savings in US industry, analogously, I dare say, in Irish industry. Uh, Dow Chemical, for example, has already captured over $9 billion of savings on $1 billion investment. But there's more to do. Uh, and just for example, three-fifths of the world's electricity runs motors, and half of that runs pumps and fans. We can make pumps and fans a lot better. We can do 35 things to typical existing motor systems to save about half their energy with a one-year payback. But first, we ought to do bigger and cheaper savings that are normally ignored. They're not in any official study or forecast. They're not in any implementation program I know of. They're not in any engineering textbook I've seen. For example, pumps, the biggest use of motors, move liquids through pipes. Uh, but a typical industrial pumping loop was redesigned by a Dutch colleague to use at least 86% less pumping energy, not by getting better pumps and motors, often worthwhile, but just by replacing long, thin, crooked pipes with fat, short, straight pipes. This is not a technology. This is about rearranging our metal furniture as designers, using big pipes and small pumps instead of small pipes and big pumps, and laying out the pipes first, then the equipment. It takes about a half hour to train a plumber or pipe fitter in how to do this. And afterwards, it has such good grain velcro, they will not do it the old way again, at least without wincing. And it's a lot more fun. Uh, and by the way, when we did the same approach in our house, it did take half an hour to train our plumber how to do it. We've never been asked for this in 30 years. Uh, we saved about 97% of the pumping energy. And the capex goes down because the pumps and motors, the expensive kit, gets smaller. So what does this mean in, for the electricity that's three-fifths used in motors? Well, from the fuel burnt at the power plant, there are so many compounding losses that only a tenth of that fuel energy actually comes out the pipe as flow. But if we run those compounding losses backwards from right to left, they turn into compounding savings. 
And every unit of flow or friction we save here in pipe compounds back again to save 10 times that much fuel at the power plant, along with cost of emissions and what our loans calls global near deal. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper. So our team has lately found those kinds of snowballing energy savings in many diverse <coughs> industrial redesigns, 30 or 40 billion dollars worth so far, from this Hewlett Packard data center in the north of England to this Texas Instruments Chip Fab, Anglo American Rio Tinto Mine, Shell Hydrocarbon Facilities, and so on. Uh, many with nice side benefits. The Texas Instruments Fab was built in Texas, not China, because we were able together to pull out. Uh, 30% or $230 million of capital costs, and along with saving a lot of energy and water. The, 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 the client for the data center in the north of England was the Inland Revenue, which wouldn't allow what was then EDS to adopt most of our recommendations. So <coughs> we were able to triple the efficiency at the same cost, but EDS told us had they been allowed to adopt all of our recommendations, they considered sound, uh, they would have saved about 95% of the energy and half the capex. Uh, now, typically our retrofit designs for supposedly efficient big plants of all sorts save about 30 to 60% of the energy with a two or three year payback. And in new facilities we do a bit better, 40 to 90 odd percent, but the capex almost always goes down. Now, as buildings and industry get more efficient and we need less electricity, therefore, that makes it easier and faster to shift to new sources of electricity, chiefly renewables. China leads their explosive growth and their plummeting cost, shown here on a logarithmic scale for photovoltaic modules in blue, now off the bottom of the chart, and for wind farms in green, both continuing to fall. And both of these are already marketplace winners. In the more favorable parts of the United States, new solar and wind power have a lower levelized cost than new combined cycle gas power, even though we're washing supposedly cheap gas. Uh, and actually, the majority of the system cost is not for photovoltaics is not the module, it's all the other kit and procedures to get the totally installed system in place. But Germany, by scaling to 8 gigawatts a year, and as much as 3 gigawatts a month, has wrung out those costs throughout the value chain. So their average installed cost for solar power is now half of the US level. So naturally, we've got <coughs> time of motion study teams swarming over Germany to find out how do they do in four hours what takes us 13 hours or whatever. Uh, <coughs> But even at the WS cost, in about 20 of the United States today, we're already at grid parity, and uh, as we are now in Italy and so on. Uh, and therefore, entrepreneurs will happily come to your house in those states and put solar power on your roof with no down payment of each roof in your utility bill. So if you combine that with other equally unregulated products, it could add up to a virtual utility that bypasses the power company much as uh, mobile phones bypass the wireline phone companies. Uh, of course, this gives utility executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams, but in our electricity innovation lab where the incumbents and insurgents have a safe place to talk to each other and create mutual value rather than lobbying grenades, it's turning out that uh, you can actually make this sort of thing into a great business opportunity for organizations uh, let me give you the bigger picture. Worldwide, half the new generating capacity added each year, starting in 2008, has been renewable. And about uh, two fifths of the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, one fifth of the electricity is, but growing very rapidly. Uh, but a fair amount of that new capacity is big hydro. Let's take out the big hydro and just focus on the modern renewables like wind. In green, uh, or in blue rather, photovoltaics in green. Um, something extraordinary has happened. It used to be that the means of producing electricity was like building a cathedral. It would take you a decade, it would cost billions of pounds, 
euros. And now, for the same time and roughly the same money, you can build each year a solar factory, which each year thereafter will produce enough solar cells to produce each year the same amount of electricity that your thermal plant would have made. That ability to scale changes everything. I was just in a Chinese factory that makes several gigawatts of solar cells every year. They just stamp them out 24-7. And that is how the global clean energy sector has been able to scale so fast and over a million European jobs, even in the U.S., which lags a bit. We, we now have more solar or wind jobs than we have uh, coal or steel jobs. <coughs> and if you look at the last full year's data we have for 2011, this next to last point, in that year, the modern renewables, the non-hydro renewables, invested their trillion dollars since 2004. They got a quarter trillion dollars of private investment, more than for all new nuclear and fossil plants combined. They actually surpassed the local installed capacity of nuclear power uh, by adding 84 gigawatts. And in contrast to the ability to make, say, 50, 59 gigawatts of photovoltaics a year, uh, <clears throat> which we added about 30 as the supply ran ahead of demand. By the way, China's going to soak up that surplus in the next couple of years because they just raised their installed target for 2015 to 40 gigawatts. Uh, in contrast to that, <clears throat> uh, nuclear had negative net additions before Fukushima. And orders worldwide for both nuclear and coal plants are fading away quite steadily, indeed accelerating, simply because they have no business case. They cost too much and they have too much financial risk to interest investors. Uh, and indeed, we're starting to shut down not just a lot of our coal plants, but some of our well-running nuclear plants because they're now uneconomic just to operate, leaving aside their sunk capex. Now, we are often told that, no, that, that, that only the coal and nuclear plants can keep the lights on because they are, the, the big thermal plants are 24-7 whilst wind and photovoltaics are variable and hence supposedly unreliable. But of course, no power plant is 24-7. They all break sooner or later. And when a big power plant breaks, you, love, you lose maybe 1,000 megawatts. Uh, you lose it in milliseconds, it goes away for weeks or months, often without warning. And that is why we've always designed the grid so that failed plants are backed up with working plants. That's to manage the intermittence of big thermal power plants and occasionally the failure of transmission lines. Well, in exactly the same way, the grid can manage the forecastable variations of a portfolio of variable renewables that are diversified by type and location. They're forecasted. They're integrated with dispatchable renewables, all the other kinds, which you can have whenever you want. They're integrated with demand response, with distributed storage. And it turns out that's enough, for example, according to our National Renewable Energy Lab's very detailed study of a year ago, to run an 80 or 90 percent renewable <coughs> electric system with good economics and full reliability. Let me show you how this works for something a little more like Ireland, um, different climate, but uh, the power pool around Texas is isolated from the rest of the country. Think of it like an island. Think of it an island. But so, uh, let's look at how to run that entirely on renewables in a typical summer week in 2050 when the load shape looks like that or like this if we use electricity uh, in a more profitably efficient way. We still need here about 30,000 megawatts. Can keep what what's that in Ireland now? Five. Five? Okay. About six times Ireland then. Now, let's do all of this with renewables. We'll start off by meeting 86% of the annual need with a combination of wind and photovoltaics. And you can see from these actual data how variable they are. <coughs> then let's get the other 14% of the annual electricity from other renewables that are dispatchable. 
everything from geothermal and small hydro to solar thermal electric to burning municipal waste, burning agricultural biogas in existing combustion turbines, burning energy studies is my favorite. Uh, and you can see that the total is a bit closer to meeting the load shape, but sometimes we have too much and other times not enough. So now let's put the two types, uh, or the, put, put the surplus, these peaks, into two types of distributed storage. One which would have less application in Ireland is ice storage air conditioning, but very important in Texas. The other kind, which would go very well here, is spark charging of electric vehicles. And then we can get that energy back when we need it and fill in the last bits with unobtrusively flexible demand. And now we have a fully reliably, reliable supply every hour of the year with no bulk storage and only 5% of the renewable generation is left over. I offer that as a modest existence proof, but, but quite a few places are actually starting to choreograph renewables in exactly this way, as you are doing in Ireland. Uh, let me give a few other examples to show uh, that this sort of leadership is uh, rather competitive on the continent. Germany was 23% renewable last year, peak around 70. I believe they just hit 25% peak from photovoltaics alone, which is astonishing. Uh, and in, in a couple of the states, uh, they're about half wind power. Uh, Portugal was 17% renewable electricity in 2005, 45% in 2010, 70% the first quarter of this year when it was windy and rainy. Uh, and uh, quite impressive, that included 27 wind the first quarter. Well-known example of Denmark, another strongly agricultural country, uh, probably the most similar to Ireland in many respects. 30% wind power in total, 41% renewable last year, uh, and peak 80% renewable. And uh, Spain in, in the spring, like in April, they were 54% renewable, 22 of that wind. Uh, so these kinds of experiences like yours support the emerging European vision of all renewable electricity over decades. And uh, the, this, this uh, all renewable vision has already been achieved in, land in at least one sector and sometimes in all sectors by eight countries, 41 cities, 48 regions eight utilities, 21 other institutions. So this is not a, uh, a fringe activity anymore. And uh, I think it's, it's very encouraging to what we're doing in Ireland uh, in a you know, fairly challenging situation of a small island uh, is already doing so well and holds so much promise of doing much more. And as for the notion that variable means unreliable, these are all the French data on wind power combined for December 2011, which was very stormy when they had Tempest Joachim, for example. You can see the very sharp changes in wind output shown in red, but the blue is the forecast of wind output one day ahead. I'll bet we wish we could forecast demand that well. And of course, as you get within a few hours, so you're starting to fine tune the operating schedules of your other facilities, the error essentially disappears. There's another very important trend which is illustrated here for Denmark, and that's the move from highly centralized, in this case coal-fired plants, to highly distributed uh, wind power in blue and typically agricultural waste cogeneration in brown. And as in Germany, where over half the renewable capacity is locally owned, 86% of the wind power in Denmark is owned by farmers and their communities and their cooperatives. So I think you have a very interesting opportunity in Ireland to uh, invent, in effect, crowdsource funding that enables local residents and their communities and co-ops to invest uh, in their own means of supply 
Uh, Denmark, by the way, has a conservative government that plans 100% renewable energy, not just electricity, by 2050. And they think they'll get there at essentially no extra cost, uh, self-enhancing. And they're reorganizing their grid in a cellular architecture that makes cascading blackouts impossible. Now, in my own country, we're quite a ways from, from this. Only 2% of our uh, renewables are locally owned. So our tax structure favors large corporate owners. But we do have this aging, dirty, insecure electricity system that we have to replace anyhow by 2050. And whether we replace it with more of what we've got or with new nuclear build and so-called clean coal or with centralized renewables or with more distributed renewables, turns out all those futures cost the same within the noise. But they differ profoundly in risk around national security, fuel, water, finance, technology, climate, and health, seven kinds of risk. For example, we have an over-centralized grid that is very vulnerable to cascading and potentially economy-shattering blackouts, uh, whether caused <coughs> by uh, bad weather on Earth or in outer space, uh, superstorms, earthquakes, physical attack, cyber attack. But that blackout risk disappeared, and all the other six kinds of risk are best managed with distributed renewables reorganized into microgrids that normally exchange power freely, but can disconnect fractally, reconnect seamlessly, and thus work with or without the grid uh, on the Danish model. And this is indeed the Pentagon's strategy now for military power supply, because they need their stuff to work. So some of the rest of us, when they're defending, uh, and my own house works this way, I can tell you it's very reassuring to live in an uninterruptible power supply that works with or without the grid. Occasionally you can go outside and see if your neighbor's lights are on, but your own lights are certainly on. And it doesn't cost extra to do this on a national scale as part of, of your smart grid evolution. Uh, it, would, it would be a huge gain in your individual community and national security as well as in entrepreneurial opportunity, innovation, and customer choice. So let me summarize the electricity story. Together, efficient use and diverse distributed, renewable, resilient supply, we're starting to take over the whole sector. Uh, it used to be that our power companies would just buy big stations of various kinds and maybe a bit of efficiency of renewables, and we would reward them for selling us more electricity. There's no reason to do that. And in 15 of the United States for electricity and 20 for gas, we've changed the rules, so instead, we reward the providers for cutting our bills. So we and they have identical incentives, not opposed incentives. This has a quite miraculous effect on culture and behavior. And it means that the investment goes other way up, that they start investing massively in efficiency, demand response, renewables, combined heat and power, distributed storage, smart grid, ways to blend everything together reliably with less transmission and let them know bulk storage. And that's especially true in the three-fifths of the United States where the efficiency and demand response, the demand side resources, are allowed to bid into what were previously just supply side auctions. Because it's so much cheaper to save electricity than to produce it that the demand side auctions tend to win the auctions. So our energy future is not fate but choice. Uh, and I'm going to skip a thing here on, on shale gas. We can go back to that if you like. But um, I just want to emphasize how, how flexible our choice is. Around 1975, U.S. government and industry all insisted that the energy used to make a dollar of GDP could never go down. So it was quite heretical when I said it could go down several fold. <clears throat> what happened? Well, so far it's down by over half. But now we have much better technology, three times cheaper than it used to be for saving electricity. We have integrative design, we have better finance and marketing delivery channels. So we now have a very clear line of sight to how to treble efficiency all over again at even lower cost. So to solve the energy problem, we just needed to enlarge it and integrate it. The results may at first seem astonishing, they certainly surprise even us. 
But as Marshall McLuhan said, only puny secrets need protection. Big discoveries, he said, are protected by public incredulity. <laughs> now, combine the electricity <coughs> and the oil revolutions, and you have the really big story of reinventing fire, where business enabled and sped by spark policies and mindful markets can lead a country like mine, or I dare say like yours, off oil and coal by 2050, saving lots of money, growing the economy, in this case 2.6-fold, strengthening security, and by the way, cutting carbon emissions 82 to 86 percent. Now, if you like any one or more of those outcomes, you could support this transition without needing to like every outcome and without needing to agree about which outcomes are most important. So focusing on outcomes, not motives, uh, can turn gridlock and political <coughs> conflict into a unifying solution to our common energy challenge, and by the way, also give the most effective solutions to the big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. So our little uh, thing to do tech helps smart companies and occasionally governments to get unstuck and speed this journey by many sectoral initiatives and projects. Of course, there's a lot of old thinking still about, too. Um, former Oldham Marie Strong sometimes says that not all the fossils are in the fuel. <laughs> but as Edgar Willard reminded us when he chaired the talk, uh, companies hampered by old thinking won't be a problem. <laughs> because in the long run, they won't be around. Now, what I've described for you is not just the once in a civilization business opportunity, it's one of the greatest transformations in the history of our species. Because we humans are really inventing a new fire, not dug from below, but flowing from above. I've even heard theologians talk about energy from hell and energy from heaven. And the new fire is not scarce but bountiful, it's not local but everywhere, it's not transient but permanent. <clears throat> it's not costly but free, <clears throat> and but for the transitional tail of natural gas that have been a biofuel grown in ways that sustain and endure and support world culture, this new fire is flameless and efficiently used. It really could let energy do our work without working our and doing. Now each of you owns a piece of that big prize in our, our book. Uh, details how each of you can capture that opportunity in ways I think could be adopted or adapted to Irish conditions. You know that we'll come up with many new tricks that we'll want to use elsewhere. So with the conversation you got at reinventingfire.com and a TED Talk and a foreign affairs paper and various other resources here, let me invite you each to engage more with us, with each other, with everyone in Ireland to help make your country and the world uh, richer, fairer, <coughs> cooler, and safer by together reinventing fire. Thank you for your good work and your time.